Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part two of Peace and Safety. In part one, we learned that, uh, well, let's face it, God made us, Adam kind, in his own image. There was a war in heaven. Satan and his angels fought against the Lord. They were cast out to the earth. So that war in heaven is right now on the earth. Now, the Lord wants us to love him. I mean, let's face it. Uh, the two commandments that Jesus gave was love the Lord and love thy neighbor. And hopefully you've got enough sense that you don't live next door to a bunch of Satanists. Okay? If you do, uh, maybe it's a good idea to move. But he wants us to love him as he loves us to trust him, believe him, and obey him. I mean, that's, you know, that's the thing. Uh, when he told Eve, you know, not to, uh, not to mess around with that uh, tree of good and evil in the garden, she didn't believe. She didn't want to. She wanted to believe the, uh, the old serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan. And you got to realize, Satan hates God. Tried to kill him in a war. So how do you think he feels about us that are made in God's image? Let's face it, God made us in his image. So if he hates God, isn't he going to hate us too? I guess in a way we're kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe we're, in, his, in Satan's mind, maybe we're some kind of an idol, or I don't know. I don't know. That's just just throwing it out there. I'm not saying it's real or not, you know. Now, in Genesis 1.26, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God wanted us to have dominion over the earth. And dominion is where they get the word dominate. He wants us to have control of the earth. So, let's take a look at Job chapter 1. All right, let's go, I guess we'll read from Job chapter 1 from verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. No, it wasn't Stephen Jobs. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed means uh, avoided, hated. So he was perfect and upright. He, he feared the Lord and hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. Boy, I tell you what, that's that's a job all by itself, huh? And 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen. Uh, you know how much, how much area you could plow with 500 yoke of oxen? That's a lot of territory, people. Uh, there are some Bible scholars that believe that the book of Job is the oldest or the first book written in the Bible. And for a bunch of years, I kind of doubted that. But 
when you look at the information and the evidence I believe that they are indeed correct and I don't trust liberal modern scholars I mean if 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 it's something written that's almost not almost a hundred years old I am very very skeptical of it so I mean let's face it if some of the stuff was going on today was going on a hundred years ago there would have been a rope shortage yeah there'd have been a news hanging from every tree because uh, if they had tranny story time in the library for the little kids uh, yeah there'd have been a rope shortage all right so his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household. Uh, so evidently he had, you know, he had servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day. I'm thinking of birthday. And sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So, you know, if the kids are partying, uh, having a nice party, uh, evidently the servants have to, you know, take care of the, uh, the animals. I mean, can you imagine just having to uh, make sure the animals get water and food and everything? I mean, that's, you got to have, you got to have a lot of servants to be able to take care of that many animals, you know. Verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, modern Bible scholars will say, Ah, well, Job didn't care about his daughters because he didn't offer uh, burnt offerings for them he only offered it for the sons so he only cared about his sons he didn't care about his daughters but I say this maybe the daughters were godly and maybe the sons were iffy did you ever think about that you know maybe God's uh, Job's daughters were you know Maybe they love the Lord with all their heart. And, uh, you know, it says the sons were feasting. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. Maybe they were getting drunk. I, you know, there's, who knows? So, maybe that's why Job was concerned about his sons and not his daughters. Because he knew his daughters were right with the Lord. You know, I'm I'm just pointing this out. I'm not saying it's true, um, you know. But uh, there are people that'll try to convince you that uh, Job didn't care about his daughters, and I don't think that's true. I think they're all a bunch of. Well, you don't. Those of you that listen to me for a while, you know, I don't have a very high opinion of most uh, so-called theologians and. Uh, scholars and church ministers and preachers verse 6 now there was a day when the sons of God the sons of God think about Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them huh all right who are these sons of God? Well, Satan's with them. Now, remember something. Adam is called a son of God, because after all, who was his father? Who was his mother? You know? Uh, believers, when they're born again of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, are called sons of God. 
Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God because he's begotten of the same essence as the Father. Maybe we should go into this a little deeper. What do you think? But just remember that Satan came also among them. So let's take a look. Now, in Job 38, we'll, we'll read this, because I want to prove to you that the sons of God are angels. Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, who is this talking about things that he doesn't know anything about? You know, if I was talking to you about brain surgery, that's what apply to me, people. Gird up now thy loins like a man. In other words, put your pants on like a man. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Yeah, because I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to give me an answer. Verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Yeah, Job, where were you when I created the earth? You weren't even born yet. You weren't even around. You didn't exist. That's the Bob translation. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, he's talking about the foundations of the earth. When he created the earth, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, these sons of God could not be humans because the earth was the, fa the foundation of the earth. The earth has been, cre been created, and the sons of God are, you know, shouting for joy. All right? I mean, Adam didn't come until six days after the earth was created. So, could this be humans? I don't see how it can be. I mean, and when you read the first two chapters of Genesis, nowhere does it say that where the angels were created on, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, five, six, doesn't say anything about angels being created. So if you use logic, like the Vulcans in Star Trek, right? that Antichrist thing. But that's what people think about when you talk about using a logic. We've been so brainwashed by television. You know, if you use logic, these sons of God have to exist before the earth. And they shouted for joy. They have to be angels. There's no other way around it. Well, unless you're a Mormon, you can say, well, you know, they were... They were in the spirit realm, and they're shouting for joy, even though they don't have a body. I don't know. All right. Let's go take a look. All right. Let's look at Luke 3.38. It's going, we're doing the genealogy here. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam was called the son of God. Angels are called the sons, plural, of God. All right. John 3.16, probably the most uh, well-known verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.18 He that believeth on him is not condemned, 
But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, there you go. Now, New Testament believers become, become, not are, until uh, the Holy Spirit we read this in John 1 and 1 12. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. All right, in uh, Romans 8 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Philippians 2, 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, uh, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Boy, that could apply to the USSA, the EU, or is it P-U? P-U stinks to high heaven, right? Or the uh, U-K. Uh, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. First John 3, 1 John 3.1 Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we, but we know that when he shall appear, when who shall appear? Christ. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, when people tell you that the sons of God of Genesis uh, 6 are humans, they're either deceivers that are trying to hide the satanic sea line, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, uh, the Sinites, yes, that's right, S-I-N-I-T-E-S, -E look them up, they exist. How would you like to be a member of the tribe of the Sinites? I think I'll pass. Uh, but the thing is, there's two seed lines on this earth. The children of God and the children of the wicked ones. The Canaanites. You know, uh, people say, well, you know, all, they were all drowned in the flood. Well, yeah, but when you read Genesis 6, it says that there were giants in those days and also after that. So, you know, what was Goliath? And what did God tell Israel to do? Go in and kill them all. He didn't say, well, you know, they're wicked, but I love them, so go in there and preach the gospel to them. No. He wanted them exterminated. And this is why people don't understand the Old Testament. You know, when you know who Israel is and when you know who the Israel is not, you know, the Bible becomes an open book. But until that time, eh, you got a problem if you're in a demon nominational church. All right, let's take a look at some things. All right, let's go back to Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, there's people that will tell you that the uh, uh, they're still up in heaven. I don't think so. I think the Lord is here on the earth, and they're presenting themselves before him. But, you know, Bible sometimes doesn't tell you exactly, so your opinion is just as valid as mine. So... Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, 
Whence comest thou? Or, uh, yo, big dog, where, where are you coming from? No, that's not the Bob translation. That's the, that's the ghetto translation, right? Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. You know, I'm going here and there, walking around, checking things out, you know. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth God fear, doth, doth Job fear God for naught? Oh yeah? D does, does Job fear you for nothing? Hast not thou made an hedge about him? In other words, didn't you put a, a hedge or a fence around him to keep me out? Oh yeah. Hast thou, hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Oh yeah, I'm challenging you. I'm put. I'm. I'm making a bet with you. You take away everything he's got, he'll curse you to your face. Yeah, the only reason he follows you is because you've you've given him cattle you've given him kids you've given him land you've given him a house you give him all this good stuff that's why he loves you but you take it all away he'll curse you so here it is uh it's sort of like in the medieval days among the knights when you know it's like throwing down the gauntlet it's a challenge so what's god gonna do oh i'll take this challenge i'll show you Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, in thy power. Satan has power. He's got a long leash, but he has power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So, in other words, you could take everything and anything he's got, but you can't take his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And I believe the Sabaeans were um, Arabs. That's, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but, you know, that's those, uh, I think those are the peaceful Muslims there, right? Well, future Muslims. All right, according to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, uh, it says they were an ancient people of South Arabia. South Arabia. So, uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. So, I even looked it up in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and there was nothing there. So, uh, take that with a grain of salt. So, all right. Verse 16, And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now, remember we said that um, Satan had power. Okay. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. All that he hath is in thy power. All right? I mean, Satan has power. you got to remember, Satan was the anointed cherub that covereth, probably the throne of God. I mean, he was one of the top 
He was one of the top angels, let's face it. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Well, he attributed the fire that came down from the sky to the God of heaven. Evidently, this servant didn't understand. No, it didn't come from God. Well, indirectly, I guess you could say, yeah, it did, because God allowed Satan to do this. So I guess indirectly you could say, yeah, it, you know, the fire of God has fallen from heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You know what, people? Keep that in mind. Fire fallen from heaven burned up the sheep and the servants. And consumed them because you know what let me tell you something the false prophet is going to have this kind of power in the end times when the beast when the beast comes the man of sin the son of perdition the Antichrist by whatever name you want to call him the false prophet is going to have power to bring fire down from the sky to devour the enemies you know why there's going to be peace? Because anybody that opposes the beast is going to be destroyed by fire coming down from the sky and burning them up. Uh, anybody know what napalm is? I was in the army. I know what napalm is. I've never seen it used, but I, you know, I've seen enough movies and, you know. Uh, we could go and take a look at it now, but just keep it in mind that the fire came down from heaven. And it's not God doing it. This is Satan doing this. God allows Satan to do a certain amount of miracles. Um, how many of you remember in the book of Exodus when Moses and Aaron were confronting Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Aaron's rod turned into a serpent. And then the magicians of Egypt did the same thing. They threw down their rods and they became serpents. Uh, but then Aaron's rod swallowed up the other snakes, the other serpents, right? And, uh, I mean, you know, here it is. What did, I don't remember the exact things, but, you know, Moses, there was a thing of the flies and then maybe the, uh, the Egyptians of, uh, magicians of Egypt turned more flies. I mean, how is that helpful? Oh, you got a house full of flies. Now you got flies inside, outside, and everywhere. So what? You're able to duplicate the plagues. You know, but the thing was, is Pharaoh's like, well, pfft, all right, so you're doing a magic trick. My people could do magic tricks too, Moses. So get out of here. Which, you know, until... The fire, the hail, the hail came down, mingled with fire and burned up everything. And then the firstborn died in the Passover. That got Mos uh, Moses, that way Moses and the Lord got Pharaoh's attention. But Satan's and his angels do have a certain amount of power. Okay? Okay. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and have burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, who were the Chaldeans? They were a branch of the Babylonians. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar. They were the ones that took Judah, uh, well, Jerusalem captive. Nebuchadnezzar, you know. And why were all the servants slain? Well, you know, the servants were there to not only watch the flocks, but, you know, they would protect the flocks against, you know, wolves or uh, lions or thieves you know 
So evidently they uh, were uh, killed possibly because they were trying to protect the herds from being taken. I don't know. Verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. Oh boy, can you imagine what Job's thinking right now? I mean, whoa, what's going on, dude? And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. Tornado people? Tornado? That's what I'm guessing. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Wow. Now, who sent this great wind? Satan did. Remember, God said, you know, the power of Satan. God didn't send this tornado or whatever it was, this great wind. Satan did. Well, he was allowed of God, but Satan did it. So Satan has power over the wind to an extent that God allows and fire from heaven. Also, all these people like the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, just think about it. Anybody that's not possessed of the Holy Spirit, well, I shouldn't say possessed, but filled with the Holy Spirit, could be possessed of a devil. Think about it. Any unsaved person or non-Israelite could be, could be possessed of a devil. And Satan could easily tell them, go fall upon these people here and steal their cattle, steal their asses, steal their oxen, kill their servants. I mean, easy, right? So here it is. Satan had power over fire from heaven and possibly a tornado. Now, this reminds me of a story, you know, this, uh, whatever it was, a tornado or whatever it was, Satan having power over the wind. Let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 37. Now, Jesus is in the boat with some of the disciples, maybe all of them, I'm not sure. And, uh, well, well, let's read the story. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Yeah, it's full of water, and it's getting ready to sink. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, Jesus, and rebuked the wind. Wow. And said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Wow. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Who do you think sent the storm? Satan did. I'm pretty sure. The Bible doesn't say so, but if I were a betting man in Las Vegas, I would put 99 to 1 odds on this bet. Yeah. So, so here it is. Fire came down, and a great wind came and destroyed the young men, they're dead, his sons. Verse 20. All right, can you imagine how Job felt? Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head 
and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Now, people, how many of you could worship and praise the Lord when you've lost almost everything you've had, including your children? I mean, is that a test of faith or is that a test of faith? Uh, oh boy. I mean, really. And what did he say? Verse 21, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Boy, I tell you what. You know, Satan threw down the challenge. The Lord accepted it. You know, and everybody thought, well, Job, what did you do to deserve all this? You know, bad things happen to bad people. Haven't you heard that before? Oh, Job, you must have sinned, and the Lord's punishing you. No. You know what? The Lord is showing Satan... The Lord's showing Satan something. I, I don't know exactly how to put it in words, but, uh, you know, basically, my servant Job, you're, you're testing him, trying him, taking everything away from him, and yet he's still faithful to me, unlike you, Satan, that tried to kill me. See, God is using the devil to try and test us. All these people that believe in the pre-trib rapture, uh, you know, when you, uh, they're going to be blindsided. Gals, let me explain something to you. In football, when you got somebody that uh, quarterback, he's the one that throws the ball, or uh, well, all right, let's say a quarterback is getting ready to go and throw the ball. Getting blindsided means somebody from the the back and the side slams into you and you don't even know they're coming and they hit you full force and you get you get creamed i mean there's people that have that's ended their careers that's what being blindsided means or you're driving down the highway and somebody smashes into you on the driver's side and you didn't even see them i mean that's that's getting blindsided and that's what's going to happen to all these people that believe in the pre-trib rapture. They don't understand. The tribulation is God's wrath upon an unbelieving world. That's true. And they'll say, well, we're not subject to God's wrath. And that's true. But we are subject to Satan's wrath. We could be tested just like Job. And God might allow Satan to take away everything that we have in this world every possession, up to and including our lives. Jesus said to be faithful unto the end. How many people teach that in nowadays? I mean, I'm not anybody special. I'm just, some, I'm just some fool that read the Bible a couple of times. That's all I am. I'm a fool for Christ. I don't even know why he picked me. You know, I, I would have probably I'd have probably thrown my rear end into the pit of hell and the lake of fire. But I'm glad he doesn't think like I do, because uh, what can I tell you? Matthew twenty four. You know what? This is one chapter every Christian should read like every month. Jesus said in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, unto the end, endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So what does that do to the once saved, always saved, eternal security crowd? Argue with Jesus. Don't argue with me. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. 
you know, demon nominational churchianity will slit your throat. They will be the ones, they'll be the first ones to tell you to take the mark of the beast. Because after all, just remember, the law was nailed to the cross, except for the tithe law. Yeah. And you got to pay your tithes. I mean, will you rob God? Yeah. So make sure you take the mark of the beast. But we're, gonna, we're not going to call it that. You know, we're going to call it social distancing and uh, uh, practicing safe, safe cash. Uh, yeah. You know, ca cash, cash spreads disease, people. Yeah, we, we got to have, you know, a cashless society. That's not the mark of the beast. We're, you know, we're not going to be here for the mark of the beast. We're going to be flying out of here pre-trib rapture, right? You know what? They'll lead you straight to hell. And uh, I just praise the Lord that he cared enough about me to show me that what they were. You know, they don't even want you to know who the Canaanites are. I mean, they want you to think that anybody could be saved. God loves everybody. Read Malachi 1 where God said he hated Esau. Oh, but that doesn't mean that. Yeah. Yeah. They'll tell you, they'll lie to your face. I really have a very, very, very low opinion of preachers. Mark 13, 13, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And what name is that? Jesus. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How about Revelation chapter 2, 26? And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. How about Revelation 12, 11? And they overcame him, who? The devil. And they, who's they? The church. And they overcame him. And they, the church, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth. What's wroth? Anger. Angry. He was PO'd, you could say. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And you know what kills me? Pre-tribbers will say, oh, well, see, after Revelation 3, the church, church isn't mentioned in the book of Revelation until you get to the end of the, you know, verse chapter 21 or 22 or 20, so, you know. You can't find the church. Uh, really? So who's this woman? Is there a Gentile woman bride and then a Jewish bride woman? Uh, is God a polygamist? Does he have two brides? A Jewish and a Gentile bride? No. There's only one bride. God's not a polygamist. You know why they can't find the church in Revelation after chapter 3? Because they're not looking. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know what? The devil doesn't care if you keep the commandments of God. If you don't have the testimony of Jesus Christ, who does that exclude? A whole lot of people that believe the only the Old Testament, of which there's not very many of them. There's a few. God has his remnant, I'm sure. And what and what and what commandment is there? Now I know you've heard this a million times, but 
Someone asked Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 36, 36, what was the most important commandment? Matthew 22, 36. Here we go. Master, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, of course, God wanted his people to be separated and segregated amongst themselves. You know, he doesn't want to the whole world. I mean, he did did God make a mistake when he put different people, different peoples in different parts of the world? Did he make a mistake? I don't think so. God wanted us, you know, kind after his kind. You know, it's just the way it is. So, the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, I forget if it's wisdom or knowledge, but, you know. But in 1 John 4 and verse 18, there is no fear in love. So when you love the Lord with all your heart, there's not going to be any fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And let's face it, if you love the Lord, you're in good shape, because he loves his children, his sheep. Now, people understand something. When God took Israel out of Egypt, he wanted to take Egypt out of Israel, all the things that they had learned. I mean, he took them in the desert, gave them water, gave them food to eat. Their clothes didn't, and their shoes didn't get old. I mean, 40 years, you'd think your clothes would have worn out, but no. But the thing was, when they were going into the promised land, guess who was already there? The Canaanites, the children of the devils were there. You know, the, that's the thing. The devils knew that God was going to give them the land, so they went there to oppose the Lord. There was a war in heaven, and there's a war on earth. And these idiots that think that anybody and everybody can be saved, they're fools. I mean, you know, the Bible is a book too foreign about the children of Adam for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. The Bible is not the book of the whole world. If you don't believe me, go to Japan and check it out and find out how many Christian churches are there. It's just, it's not fertile land. China, I, I know, I've heard people say, ah, well, you know, the Christians in China are being persecuted. I don't believe that. I've never met any. I've never seen it. And uh, I lived in Missouri for briefly, I've been to Missouri, and their, their motto is the show me state. Show me. Go to India. When you go to India, they've got, from what I understand, they've got over one million different gods, plural. And when you tell them about Jesus, well, now they got a million and one. Jesus is just another god to them. You know, go to the uh, Arabic countries. Is that fertile ground for Jesus? Oh, I know. I keep hearing, oh, they're having these dreams about Jesus. I, I just don't believe it, people. I mean, I just don't see it. Now, if they're if they live in the Arabic countries and they're Israelites, yeah, I could believe that. But, uh, you know, when you go to Africa, when you go to Haiti, um, do they worship 
Jesus? Yeah, you get missionaries that go there, build a church, and you feed the people every day, your church is going to be packed because they're getting free food. Jesus even had that problem. Did you know that? Well, John chapter 6, verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had uh, found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? You know, oh, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Yeah, you're following me because of your belly. You know, what about the miracles? That I prove to you that I am the Savior, the Messiah. You know, that's basically what he's telling them here. And then in verse 27, he says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Yeah, don't, don't, you don't want these crumbs from these loaves of bread. No, you want the bread of life, which is me, he would say. Sort of. That's the Bob translation. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, from him hath God the Father sealed. Yeah. You know, you feed a bunch of savages, and guess what? Your church will be filled. You go away for six months and come back, the church will be destroyed. They'll tear it down to build their own houses. It happens. Every missionary I've ever talked to that was honest has told me the same thing. When they go to Africa and they feed them, their churches are filled. They go back a year later, the church has been dismantled and they built houses with the wood or whatever, or the bricks or whatever. Yeah. Where's their faith? I don't know. But go to the book of Joshua, chapter 10. Now, the thing is, Moses sinned against the Lord. He could see the promised land from across the river, but he wasn't allowed to go into it. Joshua and Caleb were the two spies, the only two that came back with a good report. Um, you know, they sent out 12 spies to look at the Can land of Canaan which was become the land of Israel. Why was it called the land of Canaan? Because it was filled with Canaanites. Okay? And they saw the giants there. The, the children of the fallen angels after the flood. Think Goliath. Okay? All the other ten spies, one, you know, there was twelve spies sent out, one for each tribe, I suppose. And 10 of them said, oh, man, they got them giants out there. Uh-uh, no, uh-uh. Let's go back to Egypt. Yeah, we had it easy there. Yeah, being slaves for the Egyptians. Yeah, you had it real easy there. And you were groaning and crying and complaining. But we don't want to go and fight those giants. But Caleb and Joshua were the only two that came back and said, Oh, yeah, this is a good land. We can take it. You know why? Because they trusted the Lord. They knew the Lord, the king, the king, would give them the land just like he promised. And they trusted. They believed and trusted on the Lord and his promises. So let's read Joshua chapter 10. And it came to pass when Adonazedek, king of Jerusalem. Now remember, Jerusalem was originally a, uh, a city in the Canaanite land, right? Uh, king of Jerusalem had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it. Oh, you know, if, if 
the sons of God in Genesis 6 were not fallen angels. You know, if I didn't understand that, I would think God was a homicidal maniac because he told Israel to go in and kill everything in the Canaanite lands that they occupied. How Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So had he done with Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Now, if you don't know what Gibeon was, uh, if I remember correctly, they pretended that they were Semitic cousins of Israel dressed in old clothes, had old moldy bread and say, yeah, we came from a far place. You know, we want to be friends with you. And, and they didn't inquire. Joshua didn't inquire the Lord to see who these people were. And he made a covenant with them not to hurt them. So that was a bad thing that they didn't inquire of the Lord. Uh, we should always be inquiring of the Lord. Everything that we do, um, so, verse 3. Wherefore, Adonazedek, king of Jerusalem, sent out Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up with me and help me, that we may spite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, and the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the men of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, okay, the Lord said unto Joshua, fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Listen to this. The Lord wants us to trust him, believe him as king. Verse 10, And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Ezekah and unto Makedah. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, listen to this, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven. Wow. How would you like the Lord to fight for you? That the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died from hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. You want to fight with your own hands? Or do you want the king of king and lord of lords to fight your enemies with hailstones? You know, in um, Revelation, that's going to happen again. Oh, yeah. And if I remember correctly, uh, they weigh a talent. And if I remember correctly, a talent is about 70 pounds or about 32 kilos for those of you in Europe. Uh, how would you like to be stuck, struck on the head with a, uh, a, a hailstone that weighs about 70 pounds, people? I think your neck would snap. Even with a 
helmet on. Wow. Verse 12, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon, Ajalon, I guess. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Now, there's a book called Jasher. Um, I read it about, I don't know, 29, 30 years ago, approximately. I don't know if it's divinely inspired or not. It seems like it's more like a history book to me. Um, I can't tell you if it's scripture or not. Uh, the King James translators didn't include it in the, their canon. You know, like I say, I think it's more of a history book. I don't know. You can read it if you want. I, I read it once. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. For the Lord fought for Israel. How would you like a king like that? The Lord fights your battles for you. Oh yeah. But guess what? Israel didn't want the Lord as a king. They wanted an earthly king. We're going to read about that soon, too. Well, everybody, the Lord wanted to be the king over his people. He only demanded 10% tax, total tax. You know, that's what the tithe was to support the Levites, who were to be the tribe that served the Lord in the tabernacle, later the temple, which was later corrupted. But uh, he was going to fight against their enemies. But uh, guess what? They didn't want the Lord as a king. And we'll cover that in, I guess, part three. So we'll cover that in a little bit because I've already gone about an hour. And, uh, well, we'll see what happens. Just remember, the purpose of our lives and the tribulation period is going to be to purify the church. The Lord doesn't want a lukewarm church. He doesn't want... He wants a bride that is white and clean and spotless. He doesn't want, well, he wants a, a bride that wants him more than anything else in this world. If you're more concerned about your home and your car and your, you know, your spouse and, you know, how much money you got in the bank well, guess what? The Lord might do to you what he did to Job and allow everything that you own in this world or have in this world to be taken away. And that's what he wants. He wants us to depend upon him. And I'll admit I'm a hypocrite, you know, it's because it's easier to preach or teach this stuff than it is to actually live it and do it, you know. But the only perfect person that ever walked on the face of this earth, well, I guess there was three, Adam and Eve prior to the fall, but the only person that ever lived and died a perfect life was Christ. So, but, uh, all right, well, we're going to do a part three. So, we'll read about... Uh, how the people rejected the Lord as their king. You know, God only wanted 10%. God was going to fight their battles for them to a lot of extent. But they didn't want that. And, uh, you know, 
if his people don't want him for a king, well, guess what? He's going to give them what they want. You don't want Christ as king? No problem. I'll give you the Antichrist as king. And we'll see how you like it. All right, this is the end of part two. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor belongs to Him and Him alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.